And so in this, um, what I've been doing is we've been talking about how Jesus is the greatest of all time, but I wanted to break it up in a little category. So today, uh, the idea is that Jesus is the greatest example of all time. So you see, when you get this, this goat, right? When you hear this word goat, and typically when it began, it all started in sports, right? And so you can talk about how, how Tom Brady is, is the greatest quarterback of all time, and Michael Jordan, and Tiger Woods, and everybody in these categories. And so what then happens is because of their greatness in their specific field, people start to emulate them. They want to be like them. Right? If you guys saw the preseason game last night with the Bucs, you saw there was two quarterbacks out there, and they were both trying to be like Tom Brady. Right? That was what they were trying to do. They were trying to be just like him. And the announcers would keep saying, well, you know what? I hope that being around Tom would allow some of this to rub off so they can be a little bit more like him. And in fact, when you look at Michael Jordan, like Michael Jordan, people wanted to be like him so much that they actually had a whole ad campaign. You guys remember that back in the 90s? It said, I want to be like Mike. You guys remember that? Right? This, this is what happens in these situations is people say, all right, if that's greatness, then I want to, I want to be like them. So with Tom Brady, they'll say, you know what, I, I, want, I want his attention to detail when it comes to winning. With Michael Jordan, I want his competitive spirit when it comes to winning. And then... Well, quite, quite frankly, then, that's kind of where it stops, right? Like, like there's this one small category, one small category where you look at Michael Jordan and you'll say, yeah, that's the greatest of all time. I want to follow his example. But his example of what? His example of how to play basketball. And then it ends. That's why what I want to submit to you this morning is that, in fact, Jesus is the greatest example of all time. Because you can follow Jesus in every facet of his life. Everything that he did was an open book. And in this open book, you can follow him and follow his example. And in his example, then you will understand that if you follow after his greatness, follow after his greatness, then you could be a little bit more like him today, which is our goal. Now, here's, here's where it flips around, right? Here's where... Here's where it's countercultural, counterintuitive. Here's where it doesn't really make a lot of sense. Because if you are going to be more like Jesus, if you're going to be the greatness of who Jesus is, what you really need to do is you really need to make yourself less. Right? That's, that's the strange part about following Jesus and following his example is that while other people, when you follow their example, they're going to tell you just how great they are. With Jesus, he says, yeah, you can follow after me, but I want you to know that if you're going to follow after me, there's one important word that you need to know. It's humility. It's humility. In fact, here's, here's how he's described in Philippians chapter 2. It says, having this attitude in yourself, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, I believe if we're going to follow the example of Jesus, if we're going to follow after the example of the greatest of all time, he clothed himself and humility. And so that's what we need to follow. That's the example we need to follow after. And what you can see then is just like the video that we just saw, what we can see then is that this humility came out in the way that he interacted with other people. And so what we're going to look at today is when he interacted with somebody in the, the Gospel of Luke chapter 19, a man named Zacchaeus is the guy that we're going to look at today. Because what we're going to see is that if you want to follow the greatest example of all time, Jesus, then, in fact, you need to be loving and compassionate and respectful in all times, in all situations. And this is what we're going to find out about as we read Luke chapter 19, 1 through 10. So I'm going to read it. You guys can follow along. It's not going to be on the screen, but it's okay because it's a good story and you can just listen along if you don't have your Bible out or your phone. It says this, verse 1, he, being Jesus, entered Jericho and was passing through. And there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. And he was seeking to see who Jesus was. But on account of the crowd, he could not because he was small of stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up in a sycamore tree to see him. For he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up 
and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all grumbled. He has gone to be the guest of a man who was a sinner? And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to the house, since he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. So here's my first point this morning. My first point this morning is if you want to be like Jesus, if you want to follow the example of Jesus, just know that Jesus notices you. He notices you. Now, here's what happens. When Jesus is walking by in this particular instance, this is what's called the, the traveling narrative. The traveling narrative of Jesus. When I did my dissertation on this, the, the idea is that, is that Jesus in all times, in all situations, was always teaching. Right? So, so this would be what we think about with Jesus teaching. That he would be in the Sermon on the Mount. He was feeding the 5,000. Or maybe his disciples were around him and he was teaching. That's what we think about. But in fact, even when he was hanging on the cross, he was still teaching. He was still giving lessons. And so even in the points where he was going from point A to point B, he would be teaching. And this is what he was doing in this situation. It's called the traveling narrative because the Bible says as he passed through, he wasn't even stopping there. This wasn't the goal. He was just passing through and then he noticed Zacchaeus, which I believe, I believe gives us a really good idea that if we're going to follow the example of Jesus, I think the first thing that we have to know is that sometimes you have to be willing to let your life be interrupted. Right? Yeah, you have to be willing that when you're going from point A to point B, that sometimes right in the middle, that's when God wants to really show up. And sometimes you have to be willing to get out of your comfort zone and allow God to work. And that's what Jesus did in this situation. As, as he was going from place to place, he wasn't too busy. Peter wasn't too annoying. He was still able to stop and say, there's Zacchaeus. I'm going to stop and I'm going to talk to Zacchaeus. He noticed him. And as he noticed him, <laughs> he didn't just notice anybody. He noticed a man named Zacchaeus. Now, let me tell you a little bit about old Zac. Because old Zac, he has a Jewish name, Zacchaeus, but he was also working for the Roman government. So right there, you can figure out he wasn't a very liked guy, right? Um, this, would be very, this, would be, this would be like you grew up in Chicago as a Chicago Bears fan, and now you're the president of the Green Bay Packers, right? Like, it's just, like you just don't put these things together. And so now he's working for the Roman government. People already don't like him. But as he's working in the Roman government, he is a chief tax collector. He's the top dog of tax collectors. And the way this actually worked back then is he kind of worked as like, like PayPal, right? He was like the in-between of paying your taxes. So let's suppose George owes 20 bucks to the IRS, right? Which we can, it's probably more. But let's assume he owes 20 bucks to the IRS. Zacchaeus' job would be to go to George's house and say, you owe Caesar 20 bucks. Can you give me the money that you owe me? But what would typically happen then is Zacchaeus could show up and he could say, hey, George, you owe 30 bucks. And then he would have to give him 30 bucks. And Zacchaeus could give 20 to Caesar and keep 10 for himself. And this is what was common practice back then. In fact, so common practice that when the tax collectors would show up to your town, you really didn't know how much you were ha going to have to give. And what ended up happening on, other, on several occasions is that it was just too much to actually pay. So then you had to give up your children. This is when indentured servitude would begin, and they would have to become slaves because of the money that you owed to the government that actually wasn't the money that you owed. It was just somebody was just being really rude and mean. And Zacchaeus was the chief of all of them. He was the chief. So I, the picture I'm painting right now, he's not a very liked guy, right? Like he's walking around, working for Rome, cheating people out of their money. And then, and then the Bible is very clear to say he wasn't average height. This guy was short. I don't know if you've ever met anybody who's like shorter than the average person. But if you do, you know that sometimes people random people, not a pastor of a church, but other random people might make fun of that person for being shorter than the average person, right? 
And not me, of course, because you know I would never do anything like that, but let's just suppose that we knew somebody that was shorter than the average person. I would imagine in your mind that probably some people might make fun of them from time to time, right? I don't know. I don't know. I'm just, I'm just making all that up. But maybe that's what happens. And so now he has a job where he's not liked. He's working for the enemy. He's stealing people's money, and he's short. Put that all together. The guy's not liked very much, and yet when Jesus comes to town, he says, all right, I have strike one against me. I work for Rome. I've strike two against me. I steal from people. I strike three against me. I'm short. You know what? Let's go ahead and add four and five in there because Jesus is coming to town, and now I'm going to run. Now, that might not sound like anything to you, but men didn't run. By the way, I wish this was something that still happened, right? This would be really great if I could say, you know what, James, you need to lose a few pounds. Well, I know I do. It's just that men in our society aren't really supposed to work out. So sorry, I can't do that. I wish it was still that way, but it wasn't. But back then, it's not dignified for a man to run in public. That's strike four. I don't know how many strikes this guy's going to get, but then he climbs a tree. You want to talk about being undignified, climb a tree back in those days. Because you're not climbing a tree wearing jeans and a t-shirt. You're climbing a tree wearing a robe. You want to talk about undignified, don't look up, right? And this is, this is what Zacchaeus is doing, right? He was not like, he was made fun of, he stole from people, he ran, he climbed up a tree. You know, everybody in town was looking at him and making fun of him, and Jesus stopped and noticed him. Now, here's, here's where some of you guys have heard me talk about this before, but in case you haven't, I'm going I'm to bring this up again. Because here's where we have to go back to some of us, some of you have had some teaching when you're younger, right? And you sing this song. You guys know the song? You guys know. The second I said Zacchaeus, some of you guys were singing the song in your head already, right? Zacchaeus was a wee little man. A wee little man was he. It's getting a little weird, but yes, that's right. He climbed up in the sycamore tree to see what he could see. Here's the bottom line. Then it says that Jesus came and he looked at Zacchaeus and said, Zacchaeus, you come down for... Wow, it's so sad. Yes, I, I'm going to your house today. I'm going to your house today. Now, here's the problem. The song in and of itself is not the problem. The problem is that we wanted to teach it to little children, so we made hand motions with it. And the way that I've seen it taught to you, every child I've ever seen this song taught to, is it'll say like this, Zacchaeus, you come down, for I'm going to your house today. And I don't know why we started painting Jesus as this finger-wagging Jesus. Jesus, you, Zacchaeus, you come down. I don't see anything in the scripture that I read in Luke chapter 19, verse 1 through 10, that would lead me to believe that Jesus was wagging his finger at Zacchaeus. If anything, I'd say, Zacchaeus, you come down. Zacchaeus, take my hand. You come down. Zacchaeus, come and give me a hug. You come down. For I'm going to your house today. What, what Jesus was showing us is that if we want to follow the greatest example of all time, we do it with love and compassion and respect and empathy. That's what Jesus was showing. This isn't a finger wagging Jesus. This is a Jesus that noticed a man in a tree and said to him, Zacchaeus, come on, buddy. Let's go. Because the next thing that I want you to know that's very, very important. Very, now, now I'm starting to wag my finger at you guys. <laughs> this is not going to be good. So I get, all right, here we go. So the next thing, the next thing that's really important is that when, here, here's where the song gets it really good. It gets it really good. Because Jesus called him by name. Right, that's the next thing you got to know. The next thing you got to know is that Jesus knows your name. That's what's really cool, because you can think about you can think about the things that Zacchaeus has probably been called in his life. You can think about the names that he's been called, right? Even, even if he's not being called a name, most likely he's being called an occupation, right? So even as he comes to town, he's probably not, oh, there goes old Zacchaeus. It's probably, there's the tax collector. And, and then if, if he stole from one of the families, then he shows up in a town. He's like, oh, there's that old rotten tax collector. 
And then if you're just a guy that just likes to have a good sense of humor, you just say, oh, there's that old midget rotten tax collector, right? You put it all together. I would imagine that he's been called quite a few names in his life. And yet in this particular instance, Jesus didn't call him by his occupation or what he's done wrong or even what he looks like. Jesus called him by name, which was a really big deal. It was a really big deal that Jesus said Zacchaeus because he didn't just notice him, but he knows his name. And I want you to know today that if you're here today and you're looking for hope and you're looking for answers and you're looking for peace, that's found in the person of Jesus. And he notices you and he's calling your name and he wants you to come to him today. Welcome back, Robbie. Now, here's the thing I also want you to know. I do believe that Jesus knows your name. And, and Jesus isn't labeling you by your occupation. He's not labeling you by the things you've done. He's not labeling you by your looks, right? Even if you have stunning good looks like Lance over here, that could still be a hindrance to your gospel walk. He's not even judging you by your looks in the positive sense. He just sees you and sees who you are and notices you and knows your name and he calls you down. But I want you to know also that the devil also knows your name. And here's the big difference. The devil knows your name, and he calls you by your sin. Jesus knows your sin, and he calls you by your name. And he's calling your name today. He's calling your name, and he's telling you to come down. He wants you to come to be a part of who he is. You see, I've described some of the bad parts about Zacchaeus, but quite frankly, Zacchaeus, he kind of had a good life. Right? Like, he had money. The Bible even says he was rich. They don't use that word lightly in the Bible. They're rich. Is, that's good. Probably had nice houses, right? The best donkeys you can buy. I don't know. He had the Tesla of donkeys. I don't know exactly what he had, but, but he had a lot of good stuff. He had everything that he could find in the world. And yet, he was still looking for something. He had everything money could actually buy. And he still found that Jesus was coming to town and he was going to make himself undignified because he still needed something else. And here's a universal truth in life, true for everybody. We are all looking for something. And while we're looking for something, Jesus is looking for you. So I don't know exactly I don't know exactly what kind of trees that you've climbed up in in your life, but some people climb these trees and they think that I can climb the tree of success and then I'm gonna be happy. I can climb the tree of money and then I'll be happy. I can climb the tree and I can live whatever life I wanna live. Listen, I don't know what kind of tree you're up in today, but what you're actually looking for, even if you don't know it, is Jesus. And he notices you and he calls your name and he wants you to come down. He wants you to come down to be a part of who he is. Now, I also don't think it's a coincidence that as he's traveling through the way I just traveled through to get that microphone, that as he's traveling through in this traveling narrative, I don't believe it's a coincidence that the place that he found Zacchaeus is a place called Jericho. Because what we know about Jericho in the Old Testament is a really weird story that we'll talk about one day, about how God told them to walk around the walls of Jericho and walk around the walls of Jericho, and eventually the walls of Jericho will fall down. And so the first time we hear about Jericho, God had to bring down the walls of a city, and this time he had to tear down the walls of a man's heart. Now, I want you to know that today, that if you climbed up in a tree looking for hope, looking for answers, looking for peace, what you're actually looking for is Jesus. He is the answer, and he wants to tear down the walls of your heart this morning. So, as this happens, we know that Jesus notices you, Jesus knows your name, and Jesus has time for you. This is what I love. Like, this is one of my favorite stories, if I can be honest with you, George. It's one of my favorite stories in the Bible. But this part kicks it up a notch. And you're going to like this, especially. Because what's, what Jesus does next is when he sees and notices Zacchaeus in the tree and calls him down, not by finger wagging, but by inviting him down to come and be with him. As that happens, the very next thing that Jesus does is he says, Hey, Zacchaeus. 
I'm going to come over to your house for dinner tonight. Who does that? Who does that, right? He didn't say, hey, Zacchaeus, you come down and we're going to go together. We're going to go to Mission Barbecue together. He didn't say, hey, Zacchaeus, you come down and I'll have some of my disciples rustle up some fish for us. He said, Zacchaeus, you come down because I'm going to go to your house tonight. Who does that? I'm going to tell you who does that. I do that. <laughs> I did it to George this week, this very week. <laughs> so proud of myself. Here's what I did was on Tuesday, we were at Maple Street together, and we have this great Thursday men's group that's going to be this week, side commercial. We have a great Thursday men's group that's going to be this week. And I said, how can we get the most men possible from Extraordinary Church and outside of Extraordinary Church? How can we get the most men possible to come to our very first group? And I said, I know what we need. We need steak and potatoes. Right, we have a nice steak and potatoes. Men, they're going to show up. So all of you men, you guys are all invited on Thursday, 6 p.m., steak and potato dinner at George's house. Because <laughs> I invited myself to George's house on Tuesday, and I said, hey, all the men are going to come over to your house on Thursday. Is that okay? And George, in all of his George ways, said, absolutely, everybody's invited over. So all of you men, come on over on Thursday night, because we're going to George's house. We're going to your house on Thursday. That's what we're doing. We're going to your house on Thursday. We're going to have some steak and potatoes, and it's going to be good. So who does that? Who invites themselves over to somebody's house? Well, I do that, but also Jesus did that in this particular instance. And now here's where the George parallel stopped, because this was a really, really big deal that Jesus invited himself over to Zacchaeus' house. Because nobody liked him. Nobody liked him. He, he was as unlovable as somebody could be. He was the definition of a guy that you wouldn't invite to your house party. And when Jesus pulled him down out of that tree, he didn't just say, hey, it's cool to, cool to see you, Zacchaeus. He said, hey, I'm going to come over to your house today. And you know what happened at that time? Zacchaeus became dignified. You see, he became undignified to climb that tree. And then Jesus gave him his dignity back. In front of all of those people, he said, Zacchaeus, I'm going to come over to your house today. And this is a good example that he leaves for us, that even the people that seem unlovable, Jesus says you love them anyway. Jesus says, you show them love, and here's the reason why. It's because that's what he's done for us. That he's shown us love. That he's shown us compassion. Because of that, then, even in, even in my most unlovable moments, Jesus says, I still love you. Even in your most unlovable moments, Jesus still loves you. And this is the example that he's leaving. He's leaving this example saying, so Zacchaeus, not only do I notice you, not only do I know your name, but I have time for you, so I'm going to come over to your house. But here's the deal. The thing is, is that Zacchaeus still had to say yes, right? There was still a part on Zacchaeus' part, right? He could have said, no, bro, you ain't come over to my house. That's weird. He didn't say that. And you know what the Bible says in the book of Revelation? It says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if you open the door, then I will come in and eat with you and eat with me. But I want to let you know that you have to open the door. And when Jesus came, said to Zacchaeus, hey, I'm going to go over to your house today, Zacchaeus at some point had to say, all right, come on in to my house. And I think for some of you guys today, maybe God's knocking on the door of your heart, and all you have to do is open that door. I don't think that, um, I don't think that what happens next is very uncommon. So what happens next is that when, when he's there and he says, Zacchaeus, you come down from going to your house today, the Bible says, if, if you get a different translation than the one I read, the Bible says that the people murmured, right? That's almost like an onomatopoeia, right? You can kind of hear it, murmur, murmur, murmur. You can kind of hear that, right? You can kind of feel that, can't you? Uh, the book of Luke was also was written by Luke, and he also wrote the book of Acts. And as you have the Luke and Acts, you'll see that there's this common theme that kind of came through. The common theme, especially in the book of Acts, is that the disciples would be, would be telling people about Jesus and doing something in Jesus' name. And some of them would just be so excited and follow after everything that Jesus did. But the other half of them did not like what was happening. And they murmured, murmur, murmur, murmur. 
And this is what happened to Zacchaeus. They all, Jesus said, Zacchaeus, come down from that tree. I'm going to go have dinner at your house. And everybody said, why are you going to have dinner at his house? Don't you know what he's done? Don't you know the things that he's, that, that he's been accused of? That is the worst person to go to their house. And that's, they murmured and murmured and murmured. And you know what? Jesus said, all right, that's okay. I'm still going to his house. And I want you to know that wherever you're at in your life, sometimes we think this to ourselves. We think to ourselves, there's no way Jesus loves me because I've done this. Doesn't he know I've done this? Doesn't he know I've done this? Yeah, he knows. He knows. He knows it all. And it doesn't matter if people around you are murmuring. It doesn't matter. None of that matters. The only thing that matters is that Jesus says, let me come in and be with you. And he wants you to come and be with him. That's what matters. So in this particular instance, when, when, when Luke was writing about Zacchaeus, when Luke writes in his, his Gospels, when he writes in his, uh, his letters and his writings, posture is always very important. Posture is very important. Whether you're sitting, you're lying down, you're standing up. And what the Bible says specifically is that when Jesus looked at Zacchaeus and said, Zacchaeus, you come down from going to your house today, the Bible specifically says that he stood up. And he stood up. And all of these people around him, they were murmuring, and he didn't care. He stood up, and in some translations, it says this. As he stood up, he said, here and now, Jesus, I want you to know, you're invited over to my house. Here and now, people around me, I want you to know, I'm giving half of everything I have away to the poor. Here and now, everybody around I want you to know that if I've wronged you, I will pay you back four times what I've taken. The legal custom was two. And he stood up with dignity, shoulders back, held, he head held high, and said, yes, Jesus, I accept you. Yes, Jesus, come on in. Yes, Jesus, this is exactly what needs to happen. And when Jesus called him, when Jesus called him, he didn't procrastinate, he took action. And you might wonder why. Why did he do that? Why, why was Zacchaeus willing to, to give up so much? Well, that comes to our last and final point this morning. Is that Jesus gave up everything for you. You see, the benefit, the benefit that Zacchaeus had was that Zacchaeus has seen the finer things in life. The benefit that Zacchaeus had was that he's seen some great things. And he knew that Jesus was, in fact, the greatest. He was willing to give up the things that he thought was important in his life, the things that he had been accumulating, he was willing to give it all up because he knew that there was nothing greater than Jesus. He was willing to give all that up because he knew that at some point, Jesus gave up everything for him. I think it's really interesting to me that when Zacchaeus went to this tree, he used his hands and his feet to climb up on a tree to see Jesus. And just a couple chapters later in the book of Luke, Jesus would use his hands and his feet to be nailed to a tree to save Zacchaeus and to save you and to save me. See, in the Bible, when you look at trees, it's not just something that's just there is landscape. Trees are very important in the Bible. They're symbolic. You go all the way back to the Garden of Eden. You guys know Adam and Eve ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and sin came into this world. Because of that sin, then the tree was cursed. The book of Deuteronomy says, cursed is any man who hangs on a tree. And then, in the book of Galatians, Paul comes back and says, Jesus came to earth to reverse the curse. And in the book of Galatians, he says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hung on a tree. You see, Jesus came and he reversed the curse of the tree. Jesus came and he redeemed the tree. Jesus came and he took what was a tree of crucifixion and turned it into a symbol of our salvation. He takes our sin on a tree. He becomes a curse and is nailed on a tree. He strips the curse of his power and makes the tree symbol of our salvation. And 
as this all happens, I don't think it's a coincidence. I don't think it's a coincidence that in the book of Revelation, there's another tree. And it says that when there's a new heaven and new earth, that we'll be able to be with the tree of life. The tree of life, then we'll have the gate to enter into heaven. And listen, this is what Jesus has done for us. Jesus has taken this idea of a tree that was cursed, the sin that we have, and he said, I will die on that tree for you. So I don't think that it's a coincidence that when Zacchaeus first encountered Jesus, he was up on a tree. And when Jesus looked at Zacchaeus, he said, I want you to come down, not just to, to leave that branch that you're on, but I want you to come down to leave the sin that's in your life. I want you to come down to get away from this curse. I want you to come down to this greatest life that I have to offer you. I want you to come down for hope and freedom and salvation. And the man that would soon hang on a tree a couple chapters later went to Jericho to get a man down from a tree. And it probably was the first time in a while, if ever, that somebody had went over to Zacchaeus' house. I think this is a really, really good point to bring up. Because what Jesus does for us is he finds us in our moments when we're the most lonely. He finds us in our moments when we're the most isolated. He finds us in the moments where we're the most seeking and the most vulnerable. And if we want to be like Jesus, then we need to seek people out in those moments. We need to find people when they're at their worst, when they're at their lowest. And we need to come to them and be by their side and put our arm around their neck and know that they have us, that we are by their side and that Jesus is by their side. We can step in. We can be the intermediaries for those. We can be there in those times when, when they're the lowest. We can say, I know that things look rough right now. But let me tell you about what Jesus has done for me. I don't think it's a coincidence that Jesus went in the lowest time that he was there and he found Zacchaeus and he brought him down for that tree. And Zacchaeus welcomed Jesus into his home. And before the day was over, he would welcome Jesus into his heart. And maybe that's some of you guys here today. Maybe you'd say that today is the day that I need to invite Jesus into my heart. I want you to know it's very simple. It's very simple. Really, the idea is, is this. It's just saying, come on in. Right? When, you, when you feel that tugging at your heart right now, you feel that tugging at your heart right now, that's Jesus knocking at the door of your heart. It's him wanting to tear down the walls that surround your heart. That's him saying, yes, I want to come in and be with you. Because whatever it is that you're looking for in life, know that Jesus is looking for you. And he's been looking for you. So maybe today you'd say, I've never invited Jesus into my heart. Today's the day that I want you to do that. And it's very simple. Nobody's even closing their eyes or bowing their heads. Just do it right there inside your heart. Just say this. Just say, Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. Right? This is what Zacchaeus had to do. He stood tall. He said, here and now, I'm going to let you all know the things that I've done wrong. Here and now. Some of you guys, you have to say, here and now, I want to say, Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. And I'm sorry for my sins. And I want to invite you into my heart to be my Lord and my Savior. And so in, in the scripture, when Zacchaeus did that, when Zacchaeus, when salvation was brought to Zacchaeus, he stood in front of a bunch of people that was murmuring all around him. But you know, today, we're not even going to ask you to do that. Right? It's 2022. All I want you to do is fill out a card. Right? It's really pretty simple. What I want you to do is I want you to know that if you've invited Jesus into your heart, we have a card outside. We just want you to fill it out. And even if not, I'll be standing right here. Heather will be standing right there. And if you don't want to do that, we'll be outside. And even if you don't want to do that, my cell phone number is on that card that you have there in your hand. And you can text me at any time because I'd love to hear it. For the rest of us, for the rest of us in this room, what I think we need to focus on is the example that Jesus left for us. He noticed people. He knew their name. He had time for them. And he gave up everything for them. We want to truly follow after Jesus, who is the greatest of all time. That's the example that we must follow. We, if we want to truly be great, we've got to make ourselves less. This is what Zacchaeus did. He became undignified so that he could go and find Jesus. And I believe that today, God's calling some of us to step outside of our comfort zone, to notice people as we're traveling, call their name, have time for them, and to give up everything because Jesus gave up everything for us.
Let's have a word of prayer, and then we're going to sing about this song, about how he is a good, good father. And if you need to pray with us, we'll be right up here up front. Dear God, we love you so much, and I thank you, God, for just how amazing you are. Thank you, God, for the tree. The tree that Zacchaeus was up, the tree that he was called down from, the tree that he climbed up in in an undignified fashion and gave him his dignity back in his life when Jesus called him down. So I pray this morning, if there's anybody in here, in this room, that's up a tree, looking for answers, looking for hope, looking for peace, I pray that today, God, as you call them down out of that tree, I pray that today is a day they will make that relationship with you solid. Solid, God. I pray for the rest of us that you'll help us to be examples, to be the examples that you've set, to follow after the greatest example of all time, to notice people, even, even to love the people that seem unlovable. I believe the Bible says that they will know that we are his disciples by the way we show love to one another. So I pray, God, that you'll help us to emulate that this week and to follow after the example that Jesus set, who is the greatest of all time. It's whose name we pray.